Hi, everyone. Uh, we're just going to give this about a minute uh, and allow everyone to join. So thank you if you're here early uh, or actually on time. Um, I'll just give it 30 seconds more. Okay, we're going to get started. So um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this session of the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute Research Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Shaisa Malik. I'm the Executive Director of the Samueli Institute. Uh, before we start, I just want to review a few Zoom housekeeping items. Uh, this session is being recorded. And we will send all registrants the link to the recording and we'll post the link on our event webpage. Um, everyone will remain muted to limit distractions. And, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't wanna have a rich dialogue at the end. So please submit any questions that you have in the Q&A feature. And uh, we'll um, uh, have uh, Dr. Whiteson answer those at the end of her presentation. So the Samuel Institute is committed to whole person health research, education, and clinical care. Our interdisciplinary researchers are dedicated to exploring the science of disease prevention and treatment. And so the series uh, that we bring to you shares uh, all of the great integrative health research that's being uh, done through both these institutes pilot uh, studies grants, as well as our Samueli Scholar Awards. Uh, to date, the Institute has supported 25 uh, investigators with pilot awards, uh, and we have eight Samueli Scholars are in our initial cohort. Uh, for more information about our research programs and funding opportunities, please visit our website. Our first speaker today uh, is Dr. Katrine Whiteson, a Samueli Scholar. She's also a Chancellor's Fellow and Associate Professor in Molecular Biology and Biochemistry at the UCI School of Biological Sciences and Pediatrics um, in the School of Medicine. Katrine is a biochemist interested in human-associated microbial and viral communities. She uses metagenomics, metabolomics, microbial genetics, and ecological statistics to answer questions about how microbes and viruses affect human health. Her interests include understanding how individual and persistent human-associated microbial and viral communities affect health, um, infection with bacterial pathogen, vaccination, immune development, and, um, uh, and taking various medications and how those affect the microbiome. Specifically, um, she has done work in how uh, persistent microbial colonization triggers inflammatory episodes in cystic fibrosis patients, and how uh, phage-shaped dynamic host-associated microbial communities uh, uh, have function in uh, human disease and health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Whiteson. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for a really nice introduction. Um, and please let me know if you have any trouble hearing or seeing. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about our research today. So um, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about microbiome research, including the metabolites that are produced by microbes. And um, on my title slide here, I have a piece of art that one of my grad students made that I really love. It's a rendition of Van Gogh's Starry Night, but she calls it Smelly Night. And you can see here um, a biofilm of microbes, likely including biofilm forming microbes like Pseudomonas, and the molecules that are emanating from those microbes. And we've had a lot of fun exploring the molecules that are produced by different microbes and their impact on health. Um, the, the kind of popcorn-y clusters that you see in this painting actually really do represent popcorn because one of the molecules that we've discovered in the breath of people with cystic fibrosis is butanedione, 2,3-butanedione. It's also known as diacetyl. And it actually smells like popcorn. It's the flavoring that they put in microwave popcorn to, to give it its flavor. 
And we found it in the breath of people with cystic fibrosis, likely produced by streptococcus that live in the oral cavity. Um, and so that's where uh, that's where this came from on the painting that now Dr. Fan made. Uh, so I'm looking forward to telling you some stories about how we've been using microbiome science and metabolomics to learn about health. Um, here's a poster that I made for the Samueli Center um, uh, event last year. And I just, on a big picture note, um, want to point out that our, our goals related to the Samueli Fellowship relate to um, characterizing and promoting healthy human microbiomes, which is really a big science question still, even just understanding what a healthy microbiome is, is a, is a science question. Um, and we're also using um, bacterial viruses, viruses that kill pathogens as alternatives to antibiotics. Um, and so just in a big picture way, these are some of our goals. Before I get too far, I wanna define a microbiome. So microbiomes are the collections of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other microbes that are in a specific environment. Um, now we've known for the last 15 years or so, um, maybe longer, that human microbiomes are correlated with a lot of different health conditions, including obesity, cancer, autoimmune disease, even brain chemistry and vaccine efficacy. So we're colonized by microbes early in our lives, um, and we often have a similar microbial community persisting within an individual and also within a household um, through our lives. They're very unique. So you and another person in this seminar likely have very distinct microbiomes, um, and they're important to our health throughout our lives. Um, you know, when I first started in this field, uh, it was about 15 years ago, actually, the word microbiome wasn't even in the literature very much yet. Uh, but because we've had big innovations in DNA sequencing, we've generated huge data sets telling us all about these correlations that I just mentioned. Um, so now we have a big challenge in the next five or 15 years to use this information to find ways to make interventions that promote health through the microbiome. So a major hypothesis underlying the work um, in our lab is that host-associated polymicrobial communities are powerful indicators of health and disease. So we take clinical samples and we use what we call culture-independent approaches. So we don't have to manipulate the sample. The microbes don't have to be able to grow in whatever conditions we choose in the lab. We just take those clinical samples and we extract all the different nucleic acids. We find methods that crack open a diversity of cell types, microbial cell types, and then we can use sequencing to get a broad um, view of what all the different microbes are that are in that sample. Um, we also take our samples and use different kinds of metabolomics approaches. In our lab, we have gas chromatography and mass spec instruments that can catch smaller, more volatile molecules, often the ones that are important for central metabolism. Um, they're the kind of molecules that might be present in a breath sample, for example. Um, we also collaborate with core facilities to generate data from liquid chromatography, mass spec profiling, which will capture larger and more polar molecules. Um, and then sometimes when we end up with a really interesting molecule, we can test our hypothesis with in vitro culture models. So for example, students in our lab will grow fecal communities in our anaerobic chamber and add different types of fiber, for example, so that we can learn which microbes are breaking down um, the fibers and so that we can learn what the metabolic byproducts of that breakdown are. Um, these are the kinds of headlines that are really uh, driving our research right now. And in many ways it's common sense, but it's really affecting all of our health. So for example, here's a New York Times headline talking about the link between highly processed foods and brain health. And what do I mean by processed foods? Well, foods that no longer contain a lot of the whole grain or fiber material um, that we now know are really critical for our health. And um, even I, 10 or 15 years ago, um, had a hard time understanding how there could be such an important link between our gut and our brain. And the evidence is really piling up. Um, it's, it's super interesting, uh, you know, when we eat, so here's 
like a big picture model of, of what happens. You know, if you have dietary fiber getting into your gut, you're giving the bacteria in your gut something to eat. Those fibers are recalcitrant to human digestion. They will persist through the digestive tract and make it all the way to the colon. And then they will have the opportunity to be broken down by the bacteria. Some of the um, most important molecules that bacteria ferment the fibers into include short chain fatty acids. Um, those short chain fatty acids are the favorite fuels of the cells that line the gut epithelia. Uh, without those short chain fatty acids, the integrity of the junctions that are, um, that are holding the cells lining our intestine together is compromised. So they're called tight junctions, these um, connections between the cells that line our epithelia, the epithelial cells that line our gut. And if these are compromised, you can get a leaky gut. You can end up with all kinds of um, materials that you want to keep inside your gut leaking into your bloodstream with all kinds of consequences. Um, so, you know, this each one of these fiber health impacts that I've listed here could be their own seminar. Uh, but I'm deeply interested in this. And actually, I'm giving another seminar on Friday focused on fiber and health with the Teaching Kitchen and Chef Jess. Um, but you know, some of these impacts include reducing glucose spikes, uh, reducing obesity, um, decreasing heart disease risk, and then also increasing nutrient absorption, increasing the pr production of beneficial metabolites, including short chain fatty acids, but many of them are not even discovered yet. Um, increasing our immune response. So examples of that include better vaccine efficacy, um, better cancer treatment response, um, there's a lot of examples there. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, increasing your gut barrier integrity. So this is kind of a central model for like why I feel that I can say that we really know that fiber is important for our health. Um, and I'm gonna tell you some stories about different areas we've been using this information. So for example, this is a really fun um, NPR uh, article and cartoon that I enjoyed talking about how the different microbes in our gut could be influencing our brain chemistry. But the way that happens really is through the molecules that are produced from the breakdown of food in the gut. The microbes are breaking down that food into a huge diversity of molecules. And again, most of them are not discovered. And those molecules are influencing our brain chemistry. Um, for example, 90% of the serotonin in our bodies is produced in our guts. So there's really a lot of connection between the gut and the brain. And if you're interested in this from a food perspective, um, I can highly recommend, if I am allowed to say so myself, the lecture series that I've been doing this year with Chef Jessica Van Roo in the new Teaching Kitchen has been very fun. And we've tried to isolate out different food groups and how they are impacting our microbiomes and our health. Um, so I am zooming to you from my office here at UC Irvine. Um, my lab is in McGaw Hall, the big green copper monster across from Bio Starbucks. And I've listed my email address here. Um, and here you can see, as many of you know, if you're joining from UCI, that we're very lucky to be near both the ocean and the mountains. Um, and I've had a lot of fun having a microbiome focused lab here since 2014. Um, when I started my lab, I quickly paired up with many of the ecologists and evolutionary biologists in the EcoEvo department who have research focused on soil and ocean microbiomes. Um, and uh, it's amazing how similar the, the main concepts are across these systems. We use many of the same methods. And, you know, in humans, our microbial communities are associated with all these health um, impacts I've told you about, but in the soil, Similarly, the microbial communities have big impact on soil fertility, um, you know, climate change, gas um, uh, sequestration, and so forth. Uh, similarly, in the oceans, we have big um, planetary consequences of microbial metabolism that have impact on nutrient cycling and the oxygen we breathe and so forth. Um, when I started my lab, we had huge numbers of people interested in collaborating on human microbiome projects. And so I teamed up with Professor Jen Martini and EcoEvo, and we started a microbiome center. And our website is here. And actually, we realized that there were people all over the country starting microbiome centers. So we actually started a microbiome centers consortia so that all the different center directors could share tips on how to 
make good microbiome science happen on their campus. Um, you can see here the different departments that are involved in microbiome science here at UCI. And really it's capturing the imaginations and the research projects of people in lots of different fields. So that's been really fun. So let me start with two key postulates of microbial ecology. So one is that microbes are found in every earth environment. Um, so nothing is sterile. You can go to the depths of the ocean. You can try to sterilize the spacecraft up at the jet propulsion labs at NASA, but it's very hard to sterilize anything because microbes are such creative chemists. Um, most microbes are not pathogens, so this is not necessarily bad news, but, um, but microbes are just incredible chemists. They can use any molecule. If there's a way to get energy or resources out of it, there's going to be a microbe out there that has evolved the strategies needed to make use of that molecule. So this is also kind of a challenge, actually. So feel free to ask me about this at the end. If you can think of a molecule that you don't think a microbe would be able to make use of, I'd be interested. I think microplastics and maybe glass are potentially in that category. But overall, you know, microbes were here way before we had oxygen on our planet and are they're responsible for the initial evolution of the possibility that we could have oxygen on our planet in our atmosphere. So microbes are just wonderful chemists. Now, a hundred years ago, um, the environmental microbiologists and the clinical microbiologists were working in really different ways. And the environmental microbiologist, like Sergei Winogradsky, um, he was really thinking about how the microbes in a particular environment were working together to make use of the resources. So here you can see what's called a Winogradsky column, where you have different layers of microbes um, driven by oxygen access, where at the top they have more ox ox access to the oxygen, and one microbe's trash becomes the next microbe's treasure down the food chain. And that's how you see these beautiful layers forming, um, driven by the oxygen gradients. Now that happens in our bodies too, but that's not initially how we went about learning about human microbes. Um, we And it was big progress when Robert Koch figured out how to isolate pure cultures um, and to try to go about proving that a particular pathogen was responsible for a disease with Cox postulates. And this is what drove the expansion of human lifespans in the 20th century. So this was obviously had huge impact. Um, but we are back to a different part of trying to improve human health right now. And right now, our health is very affected by lifestyle diseases. And we are suffering from the health consequences of not promoting a healthy microbiome in our bodies. So we're in this interesting moment where we're kind of leaning back to the environmental microbiology and using their principles to figure out how we can cultivate healthy microbiomes in the human body. So um, each of us have a unique and persistent human microbiome. Most of the genetic differences between any two people are encoded in our microbial communities because our microbes have so much genetic diversity, whereas of course our human genomes are quite similar. Um, some of the most dense microbial communities on the planet live on the human body. So here you can see in this plot, the colon and dental plaque have some of the densest microbial communities, even more so than soil, which is famous for being teeming with microbes. Um, the viruses um, that are part of the community are very abundant. There's often 10 viruses infecting any one microbial cell, and that's driving all kinds of evolution. And we just have tons of unique metabolites, maybe as many as half a million unique metabolites and many of them encoded by microbes. So starting you know, 15 years ago or so, we started to think about how disease could be arising from a disturbed microbial community. And it's interesting, we're all going through life with these microbiomes that start early in our lives and have big impact on our health, but we don't honestly probe that very often. It's not something you measure when you go to the doctor. It's not something we usually know about ourselves, um, which I think is fascinating. Um, human microbial communities have incredible metabolic diversity. And so just to put the numbers in perspective, we have, you know, maybe something like 10,000 different kinds of bacteria living on our bodies. And these estimates are constantly changing. They're hard to make. Uh, but no matter what, the number of genes brought by the microbes dwarfs the number of human genes. So we probably have about 23,000 human genes and as many as 
8 million being encoded by the different microbes inhabiting our bodies. Um, if I could get just a tiny blood sample from anybody listening to this seminar, um, probably about half of the molecules um, in that sample would, would have been produced or modified by microbial metabolism. And, uh, and it's as many as half a million metabolites. You'd need a lot of different methods to catch all of them, but that's the kind of numbers we're up against. And very few of them, very few molecules have been studied. I mean, just think about how many different molecules you can measure um, in a typical clinical lab. It's a lot less than that, right? So it's we have so much to learn, which I think is an inspiring um, thing to think about. And of course, we're all very unique. Part of that is driven by the viruses that live in our bodies because there's arms races between the, the viruses and the bacteria um, driving you know, unique communities to arise in each person. And that really leads us to how much is unknown. And um, this is a perspective that our lab wrote recently about just all of the unknowns that you find in human microbiomes, um, especially coming from the viruses and the kinds of methods we can use to make sure that we don't leave the parts that are less studied ignored, because it's often the case in our sequence analysis workflows that we will only try to capture the things that are already present in our database. And we don't really have a way to include new, new or undiscovered sequences. And so um, we've sometimes gotten samples from places like we did a study with uh, an anthropologist in the Amazon in Ecuador. And many of the gut samples were populated by microbes that were not present in our databases. And so it turned out to be very important to keep those in mind and to use database independent approaches in our analysis. So um, the way that we, you know, my favorite study designs have to be longitudinal because I've been telling you how each person is unique. So the baseline or the before time points are really critical. So our favorite study designs are longitudinal where you collect samples before and after an intervention, for example, so that you can use each person as their own baseline. And then we can use both sequencing and metabolomics to find biomarkers of disease state, either in the form of molecules or microbes. Um, and when we find molecules, we really like to try to figure out which microbe is producing them. We've had these, what, I, what I'm calling culture independent approaches for about 50 years. So we've had mass spectroscopy for a good 50 years. I mean, we've even managed to put mass spec out in space to try to learn about um, metabolism, potential metabolism on other on other planets. Um, so this is something we're we've been good at for a long time. Um, so it's really fun to unleash these approaches on human samples. And then similarly with sequencing, um, we had our first bacterial genome sequence, you know, back in the 90s. And now this is really a matter of course. It doesn't cost very much. We we have a drop box on our floor where we can submit a microbial DNA sequence to get done for about $50. So it's really fun time to be in this field because it's so accessible to get the data. Um, so, okay, so using some of that information, here's one of my favorite studies from about 10 years ago. And um, what, what, I'm, what you're looking at here is the microbial diversity. So the y-axis is the number of different kinds of microbes in the sample. And then the x-axis here is age and years. So if you look through time um, in age, the different colors are representing samples from different parts of the world. So in blue, you have the US, in green, you have Amer India, and in red, you have Africa, uh, samples from Malawi. And you'll see that um, everyone starts out with lower diversity earlier in their lives. And in fact, we expect that most baby microbiomes are dominated by bifidobacteria that can break down breast milk. And then you'll see that, um, once people start eating real food, their microbiomes become more diverse, and then it starts to plateau. But that plateau happens at a much lower diversity for people in the United States than it does for people in these other parts of the world. And this is this was one of the first data sets that showed this, um, which I think is fascinating. So this is a glimpse at how we we have less microbial diversity in, in gut samples from the U.S. than you find in other parts of the world may be connected to the fact that we're eating a standard American diet with less fiber, for example. Now, fast forward a few more years, here's a much bigger study. Now you've got samples from 
about 30 different countries in this study, but I've just highlighted a few of them. And each dot in this sample represents one gut sample and samples that are closer together, that means they have more similar microbial communities. And uh, the samples from the industrialized world are over here on the, on the right. You can see the US over here on the right. Whereas the samples from parts of the world where people maybe are eating more plant fiber, for example, are um, on the left of the plot. And with one really fascinating signal, so down here I'm showing you um, the abundance of different bacteria in the samples that are right above them. And it turns out that some of the microbes that are good at breaking down fiber, like Prevotella, are much more abundant in the samples that come from the parts of the world where people um, are probably able to access and get a lot more plant fibers into their diet. Whereas over here on the right, in the industrialized world, you see many fewer of these plant degrading microbes, but you see a huge abundance of what's called Veruca microbes or a, a more specific name is Acromantia. These are microbes that are good at eating gut mucus, which is a signal to me that these people's guts are devoid of fiber and the microbes are turning to the mucus lining our guts for food because they don't have any fiber to break down in our colons. So that's a very interesting signal that is showing up across people from a lot of different parts of the industrialized world. Um, another way to look at this, um, this is one of my favorite studies where um, they have almost a thousand people in this study. And I've been telling you how each person is unique. Um, and this study was, was done in Israel. And they, it's a, what they did was they, um, they gave people all different foods and then followed their microbiomes and their glycemic responses um, and a number of other measures. And they found that each person had unique responses to the foods in terms of their gl glucose spikes and that those responses were connected with the microbiome. So they could use microbiome features to enable accurate glucose response prediction with the idea that you could help people design a diet where they avoid glucose spikes based on how their own body is responding according to the microbiome composition. A more specific example is right here from the same group, um, and this is with bread. They had people. They had in this study. They had people eat either sourdough bread or white bread, and you might expect that everybody eating the sourdough bread would have less of a glucose spike, um, but it actually turned out to be much more unique than that. And it turned out that um, the people that for some people they had less of a glucose spike with the sourdough, and for other people they had less of a spike with the white bread. And this was uh, very much connected to the composition of their microbiomes. So it just tells you how important it is in your study design. If anything, to know what the microbiome of the people in your study is before you get started. Here's a wonderful study design where they grouped people into either groups that already had um, quite, a, quite a bit of Prevotella in their guts, or a, in, the, in another group, they were people who did not have as much Prevotella in their guts and they gave them the same dietary intervention, a high fiber diet they called the New Nordic diet. And they found that the people who already had high Prevotella and the capacity to make use of that fiber had really nice responses to the diet um, with weight loss and other measures. Whereas the group that ate the exact same diet but started out without the Prevotella in their guts, they did not have such a nice response to the diet. So it just tells you how important it is to have um, really a, uh, a, a knowledge of the baseline microbiome when you get started in a study, which is a hard thing to do, but I think it's, it's worth it. So what kind of questions can we ask um, these days uh, about, you know, what, what are some of the big questions we, we still need to ask? I would say we still don't really understand what a healthy human microbiome is. We don't really know what we're going for. There's a lot of ways to be a healthy human, I think our field has actually led us to have to ask questions about what health means anyway. And we've even had meetings together with philosophers to, to discuss that. Um, it's interesting to decide what your inclusion and exclusion criteria are in your studies. Like how do you decide that someone is healthy and, and belongs in your study? The kinds of microbiomes you find in different parts of the world are very different. Um, so I think that on its own is a pretty important science question. Um, 
if you start out knowing something about the microbiome, it might help you understand, will a dietary intervention work? Will a cancer treatment work? We also have these other big societal questions um, about diseases that are becoming more common in our era, autoimmune diseases, for example, even Alzheimer's disease and some cancer types might belong in this category. Um, so people are using microbiome science to try to answer these questions. And as I mentioned in my group, we often use longitudinal sampling and go after data that we collect at these different levels of resolution from sequencing to different types of metabolomics. So I wanna tell you a story about, um, about a group of people that I've been working with for a long time, studying people who have cystic fibrosis. And it comes down to understanding the ecology of chronic airway infections. And so um, in any airway infection, this could be something acute like pneumonia, or it could be something more chronic that could arise in the context of COPD or cystic fibrosis. You know, you're always gonna have dense oral microbial communities that are living essentially at the top of your airways. So we have huge numbers of streptococcus and many other kinds of bacteria living in our oral cavities. And saliva is actually a wonderful sample to work from. We've done some really big studies lately with um, saliva samples from people, parents and their children, for example. And it's just amazing what you can learn from both microbiome sequencing and metabolomics from saliva. Um, okay, so you've got these dense oral microbial communities up at the top of your airways. And then when you've got a infection brewing in your lungs, um, you know, you might have a famous gram negative like Pseudomonas or a famous gram positive like Staphylococcus uh, that are becoming a chronic infection in your lungs. But you can't study them completely in isolation because even if the microbe you're culturing is one of these gram negatives like Pseudomonas, um, their physiology is being affected by the volatile metabolites being produced by the microbes in the oral cavity. So, Streptococcus is busy doing its facultative anaerobic metabolism and producing molecules like the one I mentioned earlier, the butane dione that you find in the breath. And that molecule is fueling the metabolism of the infecting bugs farther away in the airways. Um, so I got very interested in understanding how these communities of microbes are affecting infection. And CF is a really important um, case Cystic fibrosis affects multiple organs, um, but the, um, the biggest area, you know, the final frontier for improving people's lives is the lungs because people get terrible chronic lung infections and that's the major thing, shortening the lives of people with CF. Uh, it's actually a really interesting moment in the community of people who are um, having CF because there's been an, an amazing, um, the uh, discovery and a medicine that's now available. So the, the mutation causing cystic fibrosis is a ion channel transporter that, um, that leads to the buildup of the thick sticky mucus in the lungs and any tissue where mucus is important is very affected in CF. And it took 20 years, the gene for the, we, had, we knew what the gene was responsible for um, cystic fibrosis and what the mu most common mutations were starting in 1989. Um, and then starting uh, around 2012, a company called Vertex, funded by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, did a big screen and found molecules that actually affect the, um, the, channel, the channels themselves. So this treatment gets to the root cause of the disease. Um, and so I was actually in the room at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation meeting in 2019 when Francis Collins played the guitar to celebrate the good news that the clinical trials had worked so well. And so now people with cystic fibrosis have many of them, 90% or so. It's very expensive, so I don't mean to say it's perfect, but it's such good news that people, many people with CF are now having access to this medicine. And actually, if you ever... Uh, would like to have a mood boosting read, just Google around about the experience of people who got these medicines for the first time and had their lungs become clear so they could breathe well, um, which, you know, is something they really hadn't experienced. Um, however, 
uh, a method our lab has been using for many years, working with people with cystic fibrosis, um, has been to sequence and use metabolomics to characterize the microbial communities that are present in the infections. And we often get sputum samples that the patients are coughing up. So then it could be coming from different parts of the airways. We don't always know exactly where the sample is coming from. But that said, amazingly, the communities are very stable through time. So what I'm showing you here, each of these little clusters is a different person. So you've got person one, person four, et cetera. And you can see through time, the different microbes in these communities, which are represented in different colors, are really staying quite stable through time. So each individual is very distinct. And we wanted to know, like, is there, are there ways we can characterize these infections? You know, going into this, we didn't know if this would be the case. It could have been that in the moment when people's symptoms get worse, a new microbe pops up and sequencing is a great way to figure that out. But we actually found that the communities look quite stable through time. So we wanted to know if we could use metabolomics um, as indicators of disease state in people with cystic fibrosis. And so here you can see my title slide again, where we're imagining that each microbe is producing their own little suite of molecules, which is of course driven by the environment as well. Um, and so could we use these molecules as indicators of the disease state? And amazingly, it wasn't a new idea to use breath uh, and even your urine vapor um, to characterize uh, human samples. And you can see Linus Pauling actually in 1971 was using um, gas chromatography to characterize urine and breath samples. So what do we have in a, in a breath sample? Well, most of it's what's present in the background air, but about 1% of a breath sample is in the form of volatile organic compounds that could be coming from human or microbial metabolism. Um, and so we had the opportunity to collaborate with Don Blake's lab here on our campus at UC Irvine. And we did a study um, in people with cystic fibrosis and looked at the types of molecules that were present in the breath samples. Um, and we found this molecule that I mentioned before butanedione or diacetyl. We found that it was more abundant here in red, you can see the diacetyl content in a person with cystic fibrosis compared to the background room air, which is a really important control, and also compared to a healthy person in the same room at the same time. And we found that after the person with CF was getting antibiotics um, in response to worsened symptoms, we saw that the presence of this molecule went down, suggesting that it was uh, coming from microbes or from the infection. We also, this is published, but um, we had a lot of fun trying to figure out which microbe was producing the molecule and we were able to tie it back to streptococcus and some of the other facultative um, microbes that are present in the oral cavity. So highlighting this idea that you have to think of the whole system together because the microbes in one location could be influencing an infection throughout the airways. We had the opportunity to expand these omics approaches to larger cohorts of people with cystic fibrosis. So I collaborated with uh, John LaPuma at the University of Michigan, and we've done two big studies together now. Um, one where we got date samples so we could really get good resolution um, from a smaller number of people over many years, for over two to three years. And then we also participated in a big clinical trial where we've been um, comparing the, uh, the amount of time that people are getting antibiotic treatment. And you can see our gas chromatography instrument in our lab right there. And here's a paper we wrote with the Journal of Visualized Experimentation or JOVE, where you can see a video of our methods for how we do the volatile characterization. Um, before we got too far with our sputum study, these two studies were with sputum because that's a sample that's much easier to collect. And I'm very excited about breath and happy to talk about that, but it's a harder sample to collect. We had to check, of course, that our collection and storage methods were working. And it's sometimes hard to get a freezer for people to keep their samples in in a clinic. But we found that if you leave things in the fridge, um, the metabolomes really change with every hour and day that they spend at four degrees C. So our favorite way to store a sample 
is neat in the freezer. So not adding any buffers, which we often do to preserve nucleic acids. But if you're looking at the molecules, you want to just get your sample neat into the freezer. One quick thing that we, we immediately could confirm, um, which I already showed you on the microbe side, is that the volatiles from each person are very individual. So here's three samples per person um, I'm showing you, and then here's the different molecules that are present. And, um, and you can see that the patterns are very much uh, consistent within each person. And then some people look quite different. And actually here's this person number 13, had kind of an unusual microbial profile and, and had quite a few molecules that weren't present in many of the other samples. So maybe that was due to this um, unusual profile of microbes. And again, this, this data is um, published and uh, the methods are explained in this paper. Um, one of my favorite things to do when we have both microbial sequencing data and metabolomics data is to try integrating them and seeing how we can use the information together to, um, inform, to inform what we can learn. So here's a, a study where, you know, as I mentioned, we start from sputum samples. Here's the extraction solvent that we used. And then we've, we've been doing both sequencing and gas chromatography profiling of all these different samples. And what's really interesting is that the, um, the different microbe clusters. So I have kind of a green cluster up here. These are microbes that you typically see in the oral cavity. Here's a blue cluster of the more gram negative and inf chronic infecting type of microbes. And then here's staph, which just gets its entire own category. So the, the metabolites um, are very much associated with the, the type of microbe and the environment that it came from. So we have these metabolite clusters um, driving the different uh, microbe types, very much like the image I showed you before about the oral cavity and the airway infection. So they definitely are having different lifestyles. Uh, more specifically in the clinical trial that I described where we have samples from a much larger number of people, um, we have samples from something like 800 people um, with three time points each. We were able to see that we saw, we saw an increase in metabolomic diversity after antibiotics were given. So the first visit is right when somebody was coming in with worsened symptoms and, and needing antibiotics. And interestingly, by the second visit, we actually see an increase in metabolomic diversity, which we're interpreting to potentially mean that there's a lot of cell death, um, cracking cells open, and leading to a lot of different molecules being captured um, in that time point, uh, which kind of starts to return to the initial point by the third visit. Um, we also found lactate, which is a product of anaerobic um, metabolism in many cases, um, that we, we found that lactate went down with antibiotic treatment, which could be a useful marker of a successful, um, of a successful antibiotic treatment. Now we measured really large numbers of molecules in this study, and um, each of these metabolites has a story. So that's been a really fun part about generating these data sets um, is that you know with each with each signal that we find in a population sense like this, it gives us a new reason to track down the role of this molecule in a particular, um, health-related context. So 2,3-butane diol, I've talked to you guys about. This is related to the one that has the microwave popcorn flavoring smell. Um, and for example, you know, we've found quite a few different molecules that are popping up as signals of successful antibiotic treatment, and in some cases of worsened symptoms as well. From a microbial perspective, this has really interesting impact because many chronic infecting bugs like these gram negatives, like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, for example, while they are living in a nutrient rich environment, they often are limited by oxygen. And so when we add these um, fermentation products, um, it can sometimes perk up their metabolism. And that's a line of experiments we've been doing where we find that some of the molecules we've been detecting in sputum samples are actually quite effective at provoking the metabolism of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which could lead to a, a nice way to build synergy where you could use 
um, you could use these molecules that we've been studying as a way to essentially wake up the sleeping dragon and then have more efficacy to use, uh, for example, our antibiotics or even phages as alternatives to antibiotics, the viruses I've been telling you about. So um, to conclude this part of my talk, the individual microbiome and metabolome are, are quite stable. Um, so most of the variance in our studies comes from the individual. And I can even extend that to the household um, that microbiomes are quite unique. Um, and then that the metabolites are important indicators of microbial community composition and also antibiotic treatment response. So I'll just leave you with a few thoughts here. Um, you know, what tools do we have going forward to manipulate the microbiome? Well, we've got probiotics like live microbes or prebiotics like fibers that are accessible to the microbes. Um, there's fecal transplants, which have been used in the United States to treat people who get antibiotic associated infections like Clostridia difficile. And then there's this idea of phage therapy, like using the viruses that can kill antibiotic resistant pathogens as medicines themselves, like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I've been telling you about the prebiotics and how dietary fiber could be important, not just for avoiding blood sugar spikes, but through the help of the microbes for producing these healthy molecules that have big impact on our, on our health. We've been doing this in the context of dietary interventions in undergraduate courses here at UC Irvine. And I've spoken about this a few times at, at SciHi, and I'm happy to, to tell the story again. Um, actually on my lecture Friday at the Teaching Kitchen, I'll talk about this. Uh, but we've been publishing papers about our experiences of doing dietary interventions in the undergraduate classes, which has been really fun. And we have a new study coming up in the spring where we're going to be using a dietary intervention in a breast cancer survivor cohort, both here at UCI and up at UCSF that I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, and yeah, uh, the other tack we're taking is this idea that while antibiotics are kind of a big sledgehammer using something like phages where we can more specifically target a specific infection could be quite effective. And in our lab, some of the phages discovered have been used in people. Um, and this is an ongoing uh, process in our lab where we screen sewage samples from here in Orange County against pathogens of interest, and we isolate out new phages. And we do, we do research projects focused on how we can evolve the phages to be more effective. And in some cases, the phages are actually being used in people. My last note will be just that there are a lot of analytical and technical challenges to making use of microbiome data. And we have a real need for standards. So for example, when the New York Times poses a question like, should you get a microbiome test? Well, I mean, that's a hard question to answer. And I actually really like the, uh, the angle they take in this article. I can recommend it. Um, for example, one of my colleagues in Boston took his own sample, sent it to three different companies, and got three wildly different answers about the um, state of his microbiome. And so I think we have to be really careful how we design our studies. And I, I personally am putting energy into these different standards alliances like NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which decides whether an inch is an inch or a pound is a pound. Well, we're doing microbiome and metabolome standards um, projects with them. And right now it comes down to study design. And as long as you're comparing apples to apples, you can really learn a lot from a microbiome study. Um, with that, I would like to um, acknowledge my lab and our funding, which has made all of these fun projects possible. And then I'll leave you with these five key takeaways um, as it comes up if there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Whiteson. That was a fantastic talk. Um, and there's just, uh, I think, several questions. Uh, the first one, I think, is from the beginning of your talk about composition of the gut microbiome. Um, and, you know, you had that really nice slide about age and 
uh, geography. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, you know, can um, the composition, and I think this is more at an individual level versus population level, change with time? And then um, can you as an individual change the diversity and composition of your gut microbiome, uh, regardless of your age? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, there's kind of two ingredients to being able to change your microbiome. There's the foods you fuel your gut with. Um, I mean, I mean, uh, this is not only about your gut, to be honest, because your diet will impact your microbiome throughout your body. Um, but yes, you. one of the biggest handles we have to engineer our microbiomes are the foods we eat. So you can fuel your microbiome with healthy foods. Of course, you need access to healthy microbes. Um, and that's something that I think is a very interesting question in the Western world and the industrialized world as we have been losing some of our microbial diversity. I don't know exactly how we're gonna get that back. I mean, for example, breastfed babies throughout human history have had guts dominated by a bifidobacterium that can break down breast milk sugars but that bifidobacteria is missing from most babies in the industrialized world right now. So it might be that we have to supplement those with probiotics in some cases, like especially that's a very specific case where I think a probiotic could be helpful. Um, but for an average adult, can you change your microbiome? Yes. Eating a high fiber plant-based diet and also fermented foods is a really healthy way to do that. The fermented foods help not just because of the of sorry of the microbes in the foods, but rather because of the molecules in the fermented foods. Those molecules can promote a diversity of microbes. So even if you had like a really low abundance microbe in your gut, but then you were eating fermented foods, you could promote the abundance of that microbe through your diet. Um, and I guess one final thought on that is that it takes time to shift your microbiome. And most studies are really short, like an average microbiome study might be two or four weeks or a month or two. And um, it seems like it, I don't have great evidence to say this. So these we need longer studies, but from the studies we've seen, it seems like you need more like 12 to 18 months to really stably shift your microbiome to a new state. Um, so actually, I'm really hoping we can do one year or even longer follow ups in the study that we're doing in the spring, because if people are motivated to change their diet, it would be very fun to be able to follow that and see what happens over a longer time period. That's great. And this next question, I think you started to answer, um, how does oral probiotic pills help build the microbiome? Um, and I think just to add to that, you know, there's sort of now designer probiotics, uh, one that have like high colony, you know, counts, um, mm -hmm. and also some like, uh, the, I think the latest one is Acromancia. There's a mm -hmm. lot of designer probiotics for Acromancia. Um, could you speak to that? And uh, what do you think of the evidence or lack of evidence for those? Yeah, thank you very much. I would be happy to do that. I actually even have a question along those lines. So, um, you know, this to me is a pretty central part of it. I think what most people, when they're taking probiotics, they imagine that it's going to be a gut adapted bacteria that persistently colonizes their gut when they eat that probiotic. But actually most probiotics are transient. And so I know it's a $60 billion global industry, which I think is fascinating, but most of the probiotics on the market are not gut bugs anaerobes that are, um, you know, adapted to live in the gut. The gut is very anaerobic. There's not much oxygen there. And most of the probiotics in the market are produced under oxygen containing conditions. Um, so there's a lot to talk about there, but I would say on average that probiotics are not well tested and that it would be a much safer bet to improve your diet and to eat more fiber. Um, and in general, to eat unprocessed foods. Uh, I guess one other thing to say about it though, you brought up Acromancia and it's interesting because there is, there's a company Pendulum that has been isolating gut anaerobes out of healthy human samples. And it's fascinating to me that 
acromancia is the one that they are um, having so much evidence for and marketing right now. I, I really like the evidence from, from Pendulum, the company, where they've been showing that their acromancia product will reduce blood glucose spikes when people um, are eating carbohydrates. But I just want to also point out that acromancia is a Verruco microbe at the bottom of this chart here. I mentioned these bugs and actually Robert Lustig mentioned this in his talk last week at SciHi. Acromancia is a mucus degrading microbe. So it's present in the guts of people who are not eating fiber. Now it turns mucus into those short chain fatty acids. So, I mean, I can see positives there, but I guess Part of being healthy is having a very strong gut barrier, which is built of mucus. So eating acromancia, in theory, could be breaking down that mucus layer. Now, the, this is really a science question. I, I'm sure nobody knows the answer, but you know, my questions include like, if you eat acromancia and it starts to break down the mucus, does that just stimulate more mucus production and that in the end is healthier? I mean, there could be very positive outcomes, and we just don't know the answers yet. I think there's a lot more questions than answers in general when it comes to probiotics. And I guess, um, personally, am I intrigued by acromancia and pendulum after seeing these studies with the glucose spikes? Like, yes, I think that's very interesting. But a safer way to to engineer your microbiome in a healthy direction is with food. Um, and avoiding like really high counts of bacteria, which if your gut is leaky could cause sepsis. And, you know, there's, there's, especially in a healthcare context, probiotics have the potential to be very dangerous. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's really interesting about acromancia being mucus eating. And certainly, um, you know, when uh, people are on weight loss medications and perhaps even going through a prolonged fasting or starvation state. Mm -hmm that uh, mucus lining could be very thin mm -hmm. and uh, that then they're just going to get leaky gut. Um, so that's, yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. So that's even been found in fasting states that your acromancia goes up, which makes sense. You know? yeah. yeah. That's very interesting. So the next question is, uh, you know, do you have suggestions for uh, patients who are working on both improved health and weight loss, but may still have issues with their gut microbiome? despite eating a high fiber plant-based diet and they're not losing much weight? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, that is a million dollar question. I guess I still, I have more faith in lifestyle changes like eating well than I do in Ozempic because, and actually I just saw Colleen Cutcliffe of Pendulum Speak and she showed these really interesting data about how their probiotic, the acromancia, influences GLP-1, you know, it's it's a target just like it is for Ozempic. But when you take a drug like Ozempic, you're just hitting that hammer 24 seven. It's like all the time getting turned off or on. And um, when you do this with diet or probiotics, it's happening with a more natural rhythm associated with your daily rhythm. So, I mean, these are still science questions, but personally, um, I would lean into to diet and lifestyle changes, um, but I hear you. A lot of people are really struggling um, with in the United States with weight. Um, maybe we're gonna need. Maybe we're gonna come up with these great future designer fibers, like Robert Robert Lustig brought this up at the meeting last week. And I know lots of companies that are coming up with these um, modern fibers that maybe are more tolerable if your gut is needing to be transitioned into a healthier state or um, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I still think people are very far from eating enough fiber. You know, an average American is eating 15 grams of fiber a day, whereas in other parts of the world, they're eating 60 grams of fiber a day without even trying. So, I mean, we could double our fiber intake and, and yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer, but I still have faith in, um, or I, I still would lean towards lifestyle interventions and finding new ways to get to tolerate higher amounts of fiber, like chia seeds or beans or supplements like psyllium husks, or maybe there's ways that we could make that happen for people. And um, the last question I have for you is, you know, it, I think 
um, it's great that you're part of groups that are trying to create, you know, sort of consensus around how do you measure a microbiome. Um, are there thoughts around uh, measuring indirect measures, um, you know, like urinary markers of gut dysbiosis or malabsorption? Because mm -hmm. those are a little bit easier to measure than the actual microbiome. That's a really good idea. Um, I personally have not done that in a study that I've been part of, but I do like that idea. And actually, um, I can tell you that when people were first studying how gastric bypass surgery worked 20 years ago, it was urine metabolome markers that turned out to have microbial origin that turned people towards understanding how important the microbiome was in that context. And I've always had that in my mind as a really good idea to be using those markers. So that's a that's a really good idea. I, I like that idea. I, I can't think of too many examples where it's happening. That's maybe something we could even be doing in our in our fiber interventions to give us a more clinically rele relevant outcome because it's hard to hang your hat on the microbiome measures. So. And and I one more sorry, one more question from the audience. They say amazing talk. Um, is there a relationship between gut and respiratory microbiome? Cool question. Yeah, there is a relationship between gut and respiratory microbiome. And so part of that just comes from the fact that um, your gut microbiome is having a big systemic impact on your immune health. And so when you have a healthy gut microbiome and not a leaky gut, for example, then that will have positive systemic impact on your immune health and therefore on your on your lung microbiome. Um, here I'm showing you this um, interesting study where people are finding that having dietary fiber, even in an ICU type of context, can have um, important impact on respiratory infection and other outcomes. Um, Maybe another way to say it actually is that we have a real biogeography to our bodies and healthy people have distinct microbial communities being maintained by their immune systems in each compartment. So like a healthy young person will have a very different nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal microbiome. As people age, those compartments start to blur together. And that also happens in different immune and um, disorders. Like, for example, people who have inflammatory bowel syndrome end up having a lot more oral microbes in their gut, or maybe they just have fewer healthy gut microbes. But the point is there's a blurring between their oral microbes and their gut microbes or their nasopharyngeal and their oropharyngeal microbes. So um, the question was, how does your gut microbiome influence your lung microbiome? And there's a number of ways. One is just the general systemic impact on your immune health if you have a healthy microbiome in your gut. And then another is in this biogeographical context where keeping your health, keeping your microbes contained is part of your immune system's job. And um, that starts to break down in a lot of contexts where immunity is, is not working properly. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Whiteson. Um, this was terrific. And our team will email all the registrants the link to this recorded uh, session. We hope you can join us for our next research webinar in February of 2024. Uh, please look for an email to register in, in January. Um, also, in the meantime, uh, if you're interested in microbiome uh, talks and especially in nutrition and microbiome. Uh, as Dr. Whiteson mentioned, she's doing uh, these series with Chef Jess uh, through our teaching kitchen, uh, through the Musalam uh, Nutritional Education Center. So those emails come out uh, monthly as well. Um, so thank you again for attending and we hope everyone enjoys a festive holiday season. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.